we'll go on with, with the colloquia. Okay, hi everyone. Um, again, I'm Griselle. This is Miguel from Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Uh, we're excited to be here today with you all to present on the secret shopper evaluation that we did as part of a collaborative, um, evaluating HIV testing services, um, particularly for young people. So, how do we use this? Let's see. Okay, so um, today we hope to present some um, background and describe our methods for our study, as well as review some um, key data using ourselves as examples. Um, and we'll have the opportunity to hear from a panel of two young people who conducted the evaluation, as well as uh, hear from one site who has received the results. And so what we hope to do today with you is to um, review uh, the barriers and facilitators of um, facilitators to accessing local HIV testing services for young people, and to identify any next steps that, uh, as agencies and as a larger community, we can take to address the identified barriers. And so we'll start with a little bit of background. Uh, so this project was conducted through funding by the Office of Minority um, Health which uh, granted Children's Hospital a three-year grant to work uh, in a collaborative um, with five other agencies in LA County to support young people by addressing any of the barriers to, to healthcare. And so we focus on supporting young gay and bisexual men of color ages 20 to 29. And our goal was to increase access to health services and improve health outcomes. Just as a little bit of a disclaimer, we're not going to talk about individual agencies today. We're talking about aggregate and aggregate um, sort of summary of the results. So just to like allow people to breathe. Um, so history is really important. And so when we did this project, actually it's based on a project that was done back in 1996 for people that have been at the table for a while, been at the Prevention Planning Committee. Um, back in that, at that time, the Adolescent HIV Consortium, which was a broad scope collaborative of multiple agencies, included leadership from, at the time, the Office of AIDS Programs and Policies, and my current boss, Arlene Schneer, engaged in an evaluation of 16 sites. Um, and they really were looking at sort of core components of evaluation um, around accessibility, the environment, the counseling session, the staffing, and how we supported and referred young people into service. It was a different time, right? So people were not getting immediate test results, which is very different than our current technology and our expectations. Um, and it did employ the young people as evaluators. And so we looked to that as a, as a platform, and we thought it was important to talk about that particular experience um, and the results at that time. So what they found back in 1996, right, so we're in 2017, so several decades ago, um, they had some similar things that we might see today. So the overall, before I go here, um, the project really underscored opportunities, opportunities for us as a community to think about how we do the work differently, specifically for young people, and more specifically for young people who are most at risk for HIV, trans folks, young people, um, young gay men, young gay and bisexual men, young people of color. Um, and so rather than sort of show you a lot of uh, quantitative data, I just wanted to highlight some of the sort of the voices of the young people and the valuers at that time. So this is one example. They told me it'd be a, a 10 to 15 minute wait. I waited for two hours. The counselor never introduced themselves or herself. The guy said, who's here for an HIV test? Come up to the reception desk. Now, mind you, this was in the day of anonymous testing as well. So you got to put that in the perspective. Um, he didn't ask me why or when I engage in risky behavior. I felt judged when I told him I had an STD. Um, I got judged uh, around technical information when asked me how I was feeling, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so really, you know, I think at that time, the question was like, what do you do with that data? And that's the question before us as well today after we sort of present some findings. Um, but at the time, um, 
the findings were presented back to really multiple stakeholders. So um, whether that was the community planning group, whether that was other sort of local groups that were sort of focused on young people, but really importantly, they also reported back to the actual counselors and testers. And today, you know, our intention is not to um, point out the inefficiencies or uh, um, lack of capacity of our counselors and our testers and our community. It's really to underscore maybe some of the structural issues that as agencies and as a community we might need to do in order to sort of address some findings. So um, again, there were multiple trainings that were developed in coordination with the AIDS uh, Education Training Center at USC um, using standardized patients to really help people understand how to work with populations that they just weren't familiar with. So there's a lot of work around trans communities and young people. Um, and th those trainings were still going on when I got to Children's in 2000. There were modifications to the existing counselor uh, training through, at the time, the Office of AIDS Programs and Policies, now the Division of HIV and STD Programs. And then, I think first and foremost, um, there were opportunities for organizations, um, not just individuals and counselors, but organizations to reflect on their own practice and approach. How could they do things better? What could they improve based on um, the findings? So we're going to talk a little about methods. OK, so uh, just a brief disclaimer. So as we mentioned, this activity was part of a larger program that focused on a lot of different initiatives. So there wasn't a whole lot of funding or resources for this activity. We depended a lot and are grateful to um, some of the interns who helped develop a lot of our, our tools, a lot of the background, do lit reviews, all of that kind of stuff. So just to put it into context, this isn't like a full funded research study, and so we did the best we could with what we had. Oh, I'm using it upside down too, okay. <laughs> Okay, and so um, this is what it looked like. It took, it took about a year to go through the whole process. We started off, um, so our LACES, the collaborative, had a community advisory board that was made up of providers and young people working together to drive all of our initiatives. And so our CAB identified sites to be evaluated based on uh, whether the agencies asserted themselves as being youth friendly or through the data we saw that they were testing a lot of young people even if they don't identify as youth friendly per se. Uh, we conducted lit reviews, identified the core areas of evaluation based on the literature, did key informant interviews with testers and testing coordinators, developed um, the evaluation tool. We submitted this through the IRB um, and notified all of the sites. Everyone received a letter letting them know that we were going to come by um, at some point. So we people, all the people who evaluated knew that they, they, they would be. Uh, we recruited young people and um, conducted orientation to train both our staff as well as the youth. And uh, in the months of February through April was when we conducted the Secret Shopper site visits. In the site visits, um, so we had young people who underwent training, um, and this included uh, just HIV 101, what to expect in the testing process, what their rights were as young people, confidentiality, all of that. Um, all of the young people were tested for HIV prior to their first visit because we didn't want them to be surprised when they were participating in this activity, so we wanted to make sure everyone knew their status. All the young people were compensated for their time um, at $25 an hour in Target gift cards. Uh, and staff escorted the evaluators to the clinic site so that they could uh, do the debrief and um, collect the data after their visit. And um, yes, let's see. Yeah. Oh, the actual evaluation tool, um, we, we didn't necessarily use the previous one. Um, we had an intern, so several people we should just thank. So India Huff, who was an MPH intern, Victoria Ogden, who was an MSW intern, um, as well as Juan Carmen, who's in the audience. Um, and so India, in her role as a public health engine, did a lot of sort of lit reviews, really looking at what are the best practices, what is the landscape, um, what do we believe to be um, the standard that young people should experience in a counseling session. Um, and based on that, really came up with four areas. So the confidentiality and privacy, uh, youth-centered counseling, sex-positive health messaging, and then the actual environment. What does that environment look like that people are stepping into? We landed on 53 questions, more questions than we wanted, because that's always what happens. Um, and you know, those questions, again, were centered around these four areas. It included both kind of uh, open-ended questions to sort of get to the qualitative experience, um, but also multiple choice questions. 
Let's see if I'm pointing it the right way. So we're not going to read 53 questions to you, because that, that might kill us. Um, but we're going to just kind of highlight a few. Um, and I'm just going to bring them all up really quick. Um, so for example, uh, what things about the space made you feel welcome and are safe and welcome? Were the clinic's privacy policies explained to you in a way that you could understand? Um, did you feel the counselor was attentive to your specific needs and feelings at the time of disclosure? Some of these questions, I think, uh, matched some of the findings. We wanted to see if there was movement. Um, and did you leave, most importantly, right? If we think about HIV counseling and testing as, that, as an entry point into our larger system of care, not just HIV prevention and care services, but medical care, substance use counseling, mental health services, all the stuff that we know is important. Um, did you leave with additional resources you needed based on your HIV test results? And if yes, which ones? So there were some questions specifically around whether people had a conversation about PEP and PrEP. And then a little bit about um, the young people who served as evaluators. So there was a total of uh, young, 12 young people who completed an orientation. Um, it was a two-hour orientation. And uh, seven youth completed the requirements to conduct uh, site evaluations. This included completing IRB training. Um, all of the young people were between the ages of 18 to 25. One evaluator identified as transmasculine. Uh, from the youth, there was uh, four who identified as black or African-American and three who were Latino, and they were all HIV negative. So we did try to recruit um, folks who were living with HIV but had no success just based on what is being asked of them to get tested and go through that process. It was difficult to find somebody who was willing to do it. And with regards to the sites, so like we mentioned, there was 19 sites originally identified um, to be evaluated. Uh, Five of them were in the Hollywood area, three in Long Beach, six in South LA, three in East LA, and two in downtown LA. It included one mobile unit and one public health clinic. Um, out of them, 16 received site visits, and which was coincidentally the same number um, as the original evaluation in 1996. We'll take questions at the end. So what people actually want to know, right, is what did we find? Um, so again, putting in perspective, um, this is a snapshot. These are the things that we believe to be salient based on sort of our read as folks doing the work, but also the larger Community Advisory Board, which again has representation from APLA, Altamed, JWCA, Chibichele, and the Center. Um, and then most importantly, feedback from our Youth Community Advisory Board at Children's. So we're not going to like go through every question necessarily, but we picked out some things we thought were important to sort of share back to you. So the first thing, really basic, right? How long does it take to see a provider? Um, so 43% waited 20 minutes or less. If, as you look at the graph, um, if you put your eyes to the bottom, 44% um, of folks waited 60 minutes or more. So clearly not the quality uh, and the experience that we want for young people. In terms of the clinic environment, 69% reported that the front desk was friendly. 88% said that the furniture was comfortable or very comfortable. Everyone said that our environments were clean. Yay, we got one at 100. And only 44, but only 44% reported signs indicating a safe space. Um, and this specific question, we might do differently if we were doing this. This was really around safe spaces for LGBT folks. So it wasn't necessarily directed at trans communities or, for example, immigrant communities or communities of color. So we might want to think about this question differently. But in terms of sort of affirming signage that outwardly sort of proclaimed, right, this is a space, only 44% of our sites had those, that signage. Uh, with regards to condoms, um, only 56% said that there was condoms made available to them. Uh, and then with regards to privacy and confidentiality, um, over half of them really expressed that policies were not explained to them in the way that they could understand. Uh, and questions around confidentiality and disclosure were also not explained to them. So again, thinking about things that we take for granted, like introducing yourself. Um, the majority of counselors introduce themselves, which is great, although I would say that one of our summer interns, when they looked at this data, trying to help us um, with a summary document that we'll hand out, um, this was one of the things that they were upset about. They, they thought this was basic, right? That we should all introduce ourselves. It's just common courtesy and practice. 
again, sort of uh, another issue just around thinking about best practices and thinking about young people who may have never tested before or entered into our spaces, the importance of consent, really have making sure people understand what that process is really like that they're going through at every step of the way. Um, so in terms of someone explaining the testing process throughout the visit, um, only 44% of young people experienced that. The other 56% felt like that just didn't happen. It may have happened in the front end quickly, but as they were going through the process of the consent, the counseling, um, the sort of specimen collection and disclosure, that wasn't really sort of um, bookmarked for them. And then with regards to the counseling session, less than half reported that um, their counselor focused on topics that they brought up. Um, they also did not ask for input on risk reduction uh, and did not celebrate their health choices. So it wasn't a very youth-centered counseling session for, um, for less than half of the people. Okay. And then um, over half of them did report, though, that um, their counselor talked about sex in a positive way, um, provided sexual health information in an understandable way, and was able to answer sexual health questions. So again, we did a little better um, in this area, but still not that great. So in terms of disclosure, 69% um, felt the counselor was comfortable reporting the test results. Again, be mindful these were HIV negative test results that were disclosed and attentive to their needs at the time of disclosure. 75% said counselors provided enough information. In terms of the follow-up, again, only 31% of folks that were tested at these sites received follow-up information, referrals, linkages. Um, and only 50% said the counselor talked to them about PrEP or PEP. Again, thinking about the demographics of who were the evaluators, um, primarily uh, sort of male-identified folks uh, and young men of color, um, this is a little surprising, I think, for some of us. And so from the overall experience, again, we have some, just some quotes. Um, so you saw some of the data, some of the qualitative stuff is uh, in some quotes. So they didn't let me get tested. They told me that I needed to make an appointment to see them for HIV testing. One person told me about my insurance and told me that I have to be seen in San Bernardino County. She moved really fast. She spoke faster than me. If this was my first time getting tested, I would have been lost. And judgmental tone when they asked me when was the last time I had sex, and then told me to stick to a three-month testing schedule with attitude inflection. Basically, it made me feel like I shouldn't have come in today to get tested. So we're highlighting some of the negative responses, but we also want to highlight some of the positive things we heard. Um, because our counselors, many of our counselors do really great jobs, right? So we're not here to say that they're not. Um, so here's just some sort of from the voices of the young people who are evaluators. The counselor introduced himself and thanked me for getting tested with them. He brought out other options after I got tested just in case I knew what options I had if I had unprotected sex and possibly HIV exposure. He brought up PEP and PrEP, which was exciting. And he explained how HIV testing works. He compared PEP and PrEP, shared how I could get them both. He told me about the process, like how long it, I would have to be on it, how often I'll need checkups and make, to make sure it's working. He made me feel comfortable by answering all my questions. He also celebrated, and I just wanted to like, kind of draw our eyes to this, he celebrated my health choices around protection. He, um, he said that was rare, and he congratulated me. So, positive. So again, this is a snapshot, um, small study. Um, so there are lots of limitations. So we want to put those out there for the researchers in the room that are going to be like, what about the power and how big was your sample? Again, this was a small um, snapshot. It was a convenient sample. So while we in initially intended to have young people living with HIV participate, um, and we're very thoughtful about what that would look like in terms of our conversations with the IRB, we weren't able to include them, unfortunately. The young people who did step forward weren't in places in their lives where they could complete. It was a rigorous process to be an evaluator. Um, they had to you know, complete the IRB process and good clinical practices kind of um, training that our IRB requires. Um, so we weren't really able to show or evaluate what would a positive test result look like. And I think that was one of our initial hopes. Um, again, like I said, it's a snapshot evaluation. Um, we only visited each site once. Um, and that's really only one counselor's performance and their performance that day at that time, right? We all know that sometimes our 
interactions look different from day to day and depending on what happened five minutes ago. Um, and this was HIV testing only, um, so we weren't able to look at necessarily uh, STI results, which I think is an important part of what we need to look at based on a lot of the conversations we've had at this table. Um, but we do think it's useful data. Um, we are gonna hand out these lovely little kind of one pager back and forth that sort of highlights some of the other information. And then um, we are open to um, sharing whatever else people want um, and people can see us at the break. We were told we had a short amount of time today, so we're rushing a little because we want to make sure that um, we bring up panelists who are evaluators and, and, and kind of give us the opportunity to really like digest this in dialogue. For some uh, recommendations, first, just want to uh, you know remind us all in the room that responding to these results is really up to all of us, and so our recommendations are not really a judgment of our counselors. Again, uh, really, I think the results um, are a sign of all of the systemic and structural issues that make providing quality testing difficult. And so our recommendations are to share findings with the HIV testing staff um, at the DHSP quarterly testing coordinator meeting, and as well as through C2PLA, which is a coalition that focuses specifically on uh, supporting the healthcare of young gay and bisexual men of color. Um, also, through the commission standards, uh, we believe that they should stress the importance of explaining procedures and policies to clients. So again, very basic. If you're going to do something to me, you should explain to me what it is that you're doing. Um, also, you know, just to make sure that we have ongoing input from young people at the commission and um, in all of our standards, that we can focus on membership recruitment and retention of, of uh, youth commissioners. And also to go back again and update the basic one and basic two trainings um, that DHSP provides for um, the testing counselors and look at it with this lens um, in response to the findings of this activity.